Hi everybody, my name is Miranda and today I'm here to discuss NBSU aka Never Stop Blowing Up episode 8. I cannot believe that we are already almost done with this season. I actually don't want to think about that too much because even saying that out loud made me incredibly sad. So we only have two episodes after this and episode 8 was like the big plot twist. I want to say delivery but like promise. It's also the longest episode that we've had in a little bit if I'm correct. It's over two hours and I think every other episode except for like one has been an hour and 40. So we were really in it and I feel like when they are longer episodes they really do. I mean every episode literally actually scratch that. I take that back because all of these episodes are wild but it just gave us more time to act in the action movie aspect of it. So this one was definitely an homage, if you will, to the John Wick movies with the idea of them going to this club that is also a assassin hotel. I love that they like broke down the lore of John Wick in like two seconds. Like it was just so funny how they were like, yeah, so you can't kill anyone at this hotel. But what we've been finding out is people do that anyway, because I guess you can't kill anyone anywhere. And they're kind of already okay with breaking that rule. So them following this rule here doesn't really matter to them. So we also get to find out some fun stuff about our girl Jennifer Drips, who I feel like has been the most kind of enigma I would say outside of maybe Kingskin in terms of like the person actually connecting with the character that they are. Russell has really been kind of just floating under the radar which I feel like is a very Russell move like that's kind of how he is. So we found out in this episode that Russell and Jennifer are actually a lot more alike than you would originally think. So much like Russell who I saw someone on Tumblr collecting like the the receipts the examples of how they're similar but how Jennifer was saying you have all these love letters addressed to names that are aliases right so it's all these great things but they're not addressed to her meaning they're not actually about her they're about like whoever her alias of the week was or something like that who she wanted them to fall in love with is very similar to Russell's thing that we saw in episode one when he was going through his text and it was like you have a lot of nice text saying good things from numbers that aren't saved. So it's like there's no personal connections to anyone for either of them and they're suffering because of that. And Brennan brought out the line and it was heavy. I mean you know you know it's a good season when Brennan brings out the line that you have to write down where he said that like if Jennifer and Russell in this case but referring to Jennifer if for Jennifer attention was connection she'd be swimming in connection because she has attention everywhere she goes. Russell has attention everywhere he goes but there's no meaningful connection for that aside from dang for Russell and no one for Jennifer. We got to see that she had this one kind of fling that really broke up with her because again was like I can't get to know the real you. Like I feel like even when we're together you're a million miles away and stuff like that and we don't really know I think so far the uh, the cause behind that obviously for Jennifer it's like her job and just like the personality and stuff like that and I'm sure there's more to that background but for Russell we don't really know like why he's like that necessarily of why he's so since he is kind of like life of the party always willing to lend a hand stuff like that why he just doesn't make those connections with people and the one person we did see him have was the ex that was mentioned at the beginning of episode one who he also has like a letter from and stuff like that. So it was just very interesting and I feel like the way Allie's playing it is very, very, very emotional and intriguing. I feel like in general the way they're playing Russell is just so good to me because it's like even when they're not the focus of the scene or they're in the scene and they're reacting to like other things, I feel like they're just so good about the minute expressions that you're like, oh, that's Russell. That's not even Allie right now. Like there was a scene in this episode that I rewound and watched when um, I think Barsimian was talking to Paula then and was like, oh, Paula, you've been having fun, right? And she was like, like stuttering, like just like saying like, I've been having blah, blah, blah. And it was just kind of like, they cut to Allie and you could just so tell it was Russell in like character, you know, of like Allie Russell just kind of looking at Paula, like just kind of sizing her up. And I feel like, there's a lot to Russell that I think he's kind of realizing maybe that the sacrifice of no one knowing you and no one being connected to you is you're not also connected to anyone else. Like I feel like we've seen him team up with Paula the most obviously because everyone's trying to get them together. I honestly can't tell if she's going to get together with Russell which I would love that. My little ship of heart would love that or if she's going to get back together with her husband. I really can't tell what's going to happen but we've seen multiple instances now where Russell mentions like, oh, I didn't know like your divorce was that bad. I didn't know you're the one that divorced him, stuff like that. And like, obviously, Paula's not gonna like 
out and proud like say hey I divorced my husband or something because she's still struggling with it as she's in herself but I think there have been instances of that where Russell's like oh I didn't know this and almost looks a little like unsure like why don't I you know what I mean of like hey if everyone's supposed to think I'm cool and like open up to me why are these things being kept a secret from me so I just feel like there's a lot that we could still explore in two episodes with Jennifer and Russell and it's been interesting since they've kind of been in the background compared to like Vic and Wendell who have connected, Jack, Jeff, and Paul who have connected, Kingskin and um, Liv haven't really connected. Greg and Dang kind of had their thing out last episode, but I could still see them having another heart to heart or something like that. And then G13 and Usha. Hopefully we got that greasy boy out of here, okay? But it's just very interesting. We're also, I think, gonna see more of Kingskin and Liv kind of connecting because Alex did say in the club specifically that Liv has not like really learned anything from Kingskin as of now is not like processing like the similarities they may have which we know is that he's kind of like this smart person who quote unquote threw his life away for a life of crime much like I mean much like but that's also kind of an exaggeration but like how Liv currently we see is grappling with like I think she got into Stanford right and it has like it's past the date to like accept right so she's past that and hasn't told anyone people still think she's going to Stanford and she's also stealing stuff from the local Walgreens so there's definitely some connections there that can be made the also biggest thing well I will say the second biggest thing that happened because I honestly did not think this was gonna happen okay when they did the adventuring party and they bought the suite for the like when you all have a d20 I was honestly kind of disappointed because I just felt like out of all the suites they've unlocked the fact that they had to roll nat 20s for this just seemed so unrealistic to me. Like the odds of it just seemed so completely absurd that I was like, oh, this is like a cool feature, but one I feel like we're really never going to get to see. So imagine my surprise when in the very next episode, not even like halfway through, if he rolls a nat 20 on his double blow up, like I was freaking out as much as they were when I saw that. And I'm so glad that he did decided to do the like, obviously he decided to do that because who wouldn't but switch and be the GM for 60 seconds. And I love how Brennan was like, this isn't going to come back to bite me in the butt at all. And then it immediately did when he was like, it was so smart to be like, everyone is going to let us in. They're going to protect us. Like anyone who comes for us, they're going to be like, they're not here. And then they're going to kill them. It was just such a smart move and then at the end just being like and they um you know <laughs> like it was just so funny and I really hope that other people can roll in that 20s I don't know because I know for a fact I'll have to go back and watch the trailer because I know when they first introduced that mechanic people went back and watched that trailer and you could see in it like the 60 on the clock in the background so if you can see their outfits I'll have to see if they match up or if someone else rolls that because Honestly, any of them at this point would be so funny to me to roll it, but like Allie, Reka, Reka, especially after what Brennan has been putting her through when he gives her like these high, I loved when she had that idea of like trying to convince the uh, Santo Patron guy to like just have a moment of silence and Brennan gave her a 40 and she's like, why are my checks always so crazy high? And then Izzy like just dead face was like, cause you say the craziest shit. Like it's so perfect, but I feel like that would be just amazing. Like the stuff she would come up with and then Brennan just has to roll with it. So I was very excited because I didn't think that was gonna come up at all. I thought that was just kind of like not a waste of money because like that's the only thing you can get with a nat 20 suite or whatever. But I just felt like the odds of it are so, so low considering there's like not really any advantage unless, you know, you get a nat 20, then drop down and take the thing where you can roll every dice twice. So to have it happen so quickly was so awesome. And I don't want to get greedy, but I really hope it happens again. So we had that happen. That was amazing. Then the other thing we had happen was, and I have to give myself a pat on the back for this, we found Dave. I knew Dave was going to be around and I knew the longer he didn't show up that meant that he was going to be a bad guy. He's the president of the United States and it's exactly what I kind of thought and I think uh, I don't remember if he nailed it in the actual episode or in the adventuring party. I think it's in the adventuring party afterwards but Jacob was talking about how like he's like going to want all the power all the money like he's not gonna want to go back and what's interesting actually is that we find out this shadow falcon protocol has not happened originally I thought because Barsimi didn't know it that like Dave himself initiated this and I was like oh my gosh but then it was kind of weird because you were like well Usha did wake up with the shadow falcon protocol as her MacGuffin so it would be weird because it's like if they all got sucked into the the movie at the same time how was he able to form this thing already to the point where like G13 so involved, Hallwell so involved and all that. So it more sounds like what happened is no one's ever 
like, I don't know if it's specifically these seven people that have to get sucked in for this to happen, or if someone specifically has to get sucked in that matches the president, but I, this storyline, this plot line has never been activated before. So again, I don't know if that's because like no one's been the president before. It's always just been an NPC or if it's specifically like someone being G13, like they're specifically playing out a movie that just hasn't happened yet. Uh, we'll never know though, because Bar Simeon's dead. So <laughs> I had such a bad feeling when we were getting towards like the end of the episode and he's like in the jungle. As soon as he was like, come meet me here, guys. I was like, this is not gonna go good <laughs> because you know we have two episodes left. I don't know if like the whole mafia thing was like a red herring exactly, or if he's gonna be involved with this stuff too. But yeah, the shadow pro prep, the Shadow Falcon Protocol, why is that so hard to say sometimes, definitely is like this big bad thing that I didn't even really think of. I kind of thought it was just like a side plot, like how like we had like what was going on with Vic and like his story or something. So I did not expect it to now be like this big thing. But yeah, I definitely am um, ending it with Bar Simeon's getting killed. As soon as he said like everything's gonna be all right and then immediately gets shot, like that's action movie. That's like when someone's saying like they have all the information, meet back at their house and then you're like, okay, they're actually never getting to their house or you're gonna get to their house right as they get killed. You know, it felt like that kind of moment. So definitely action movie-esque. I'm worried about how they can get back now though because like, I don't know if it's just literally you have to hold your MacGuffin and say those words he said, um, but yeah, hopefully they can send themselves back. Oh, another thought that I liked too was um, Dan got to find uh, the woman from the radio station. He found her MacGuffin in this one and he took it. And I also really liked it because um, Reka, I mean Reka, but like Usha, realized what it was, I think. I don't know if Dang realized it because Jacob plays it close to the chest a lot of times, but they held it up and I was like, that's weird. Why do they have like a prop for cigarettes and then like she gasped and I was like oh yeah the lady so now she can go back if she wants to which is kind of nice just to have that option you know I don't know if she would want to but to consider that too it looks like Dang is trying to change never stop blowing up like change its actual structure which is interesting because I wonder you would think the tape would start to fight back at a point like right but like he got on the tv and was like and I love how Brennan did it of like the, the, the things and like Jacob was like oh that's Dave it was just so like literally like put me in a room like a football field stadium okay right put me on one side and put my manager from like my customer service job when I was 18 on the other side my back is to them I don't even know they're there I'm hearing their even like the shuffle of their shoes and I'm getting like a shiver down my spine so like for a dang to be like oh, I know that is like actually on point you know what I mean like everyone has that person that it's like anything they do it's like you know it's them but yeah I just feel like he's I guess trying to change never stop blowing up because he was like the the explosion like we're gonna really start cutting down on that those that stuff isn't gonna happen anymore so I'm just like Dave it it also is very Brennan to put the villain as the president of the United States that's kind of funny because we've seen the connections and the parallels in so many of them and their characters of like Usha realizing that like she needs to change and like it's almost like a stubbornness and like not wanting to change kills you after a while and then we have Jennifer and Russell realizing that they both lack this like connection with other people. We've got Vic and Wendell who are realizing like the importance of family but also standing up to your family. And then Kingskin and Liv have yet to learn their lesson but we think we know what's going on. So to put it as the president who is again because it's Dave like Dave's this like we've seen this just awful guy. He's greedy. He's rude. He's in charge as a leader. <laughs> so it's just kind of like interesting that that's who is the parallel is the president in this world a greedy guy who is rude only cares about himself and is just a leader so I never would have guessed that he was the president but I'm very happy that I did guess that he's in never stop blowing up I, I feel like I don't always get the plot points like sometimes I'm so just overworks by like what's going on or like I get distracted so from the minute that they like all got pulled into the game I was like Dave is here somewhere so I'm glad that I never let that thread go because it was shocking that he was the president and that that's how it came out but I was like I knew it when he came on it felt so vindicating so yeah next episode is them gonna be trying to get out of this jungle I assume because whoever went after Barsimian I think is gonna be after them I'm assuming it's tied to Dave in some way I could be wrong because Dave's not gonna want to leave this game let's be honest it's gonna be unwilling to say the least and then it looks like they also get to Washington DC so everything must go okay in the jungle and we're gonna confront Dave and see just like 
what exactly he's been up to. So yeah, this episode was so fun. I'm so excited. They all have all their MacGuffins now, so hopefully they can all hang on to them. We also got some development on the Wendell and um, Liv front. I really like them. Again, Russell and Paula, I can't tell if they're going to get together or not. I would absolutely love that. But Wendell and Liv are absolutely going to get together. I think it's so cute. And like, even the scene where like he was remembering what happened and she was like so drunk and partying with Kingskin and she was just like, I like you, but like, I really like him not in the headspace right now for like a relationship or something like that. Not remembering that she said this and then he was like, it's okay. I'll kiss you when you're sober. I was like, oh, that's so cute. And he's like, I'll give you as much space and time as you want. It was just really cute. And I'm excited to see the development on that. And it's also funny just because it's like, it is a high school boy and a high school girl, but then, like, in this world, they're, like, a uh, six-foot huge crime boss and then, like, a fast and furious street racer that are just having these, like, intense conversations and almost kissing, and it must be, like, so just... Well, I would say strange to look at because it's, like, oh, what would you think they have in common? But then this world is very LGBT-friendly, and I love that. Like, everyone they talk to is, like, you know, just completely supportive they're criminals but they're supportive and I love that it gives me like um escape from the blood key vibes where they're like we're villains but we're not monsters <laughs> you know so yeah anyway if you have seen this episode let me know what you thought about it down below in the comments also make sure to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and what you're expecting for episode nine and I will see you guys next time bye